This is Legacy Battle. Make sure you hit like and subscribe, whatever you're listening on. I'm Michael Adams, creator of Legacy Battle. My co-host tonight from the Good Iron Battle Zone, Brian King. Director of Operations for the Canadian Baseball Hall of Fame, Scott Crawford. And we got an interview here, special interview tonight. Uh, current bench coach for the Arizona Diamondbacks, drafted by the Pittsburgh Pirates in 86. He remained with that organization all the way until 2014 uh, when he became the manager of the, the Texas Rangers. And he won the division title twice in his first two seasons there, taking them to the playoffs. Texas was coming off some, let's just say, really poor seasons right before that. So he turned that team around. So we got Jeff Bannister. Jeff, thank you so much for taking time. We, we know spring training is getting going here for you. We really appreciate you coming on. No, I, thank you guys. I, it's, it's a great pleasure of mine. I, you know, hey, what better place to talk baseball and uh, life and – uh, I, I do appreciate it. Thanks for having me on. Awesome. Well, Brian and I grew up in Pittsburgh, so anytime we, we get someone involved with the, the, the Pirates organization, we're always happy about that one. So uh, we're going to start out tonight with Brian. Go ahead. Okay, Jeff. So I, I'll get right into it. I, I, you know, I read the story about, you know, as a team, you face the prospect of losing a leg uh, due to bone cancer. Uh, can you tell us all, you know, what went on there, what, what you went through there? Yeah, you know, and, and, and listen, there's, uh, you know, I get asked that question a lot. It's, it's, it's part of uh, who I am. Uh, it's part of what shaped me. Uh, you know, there was a situation and, um, you know, I tell people that I was playing in a, a high school football playoff game as, as a junior and, and there were uh, uh, the game that ended our season. And, and so, but during the game, I twisted my ankle and I'm like, and for a number of, and that was in November. And so for almost a month, uh, you know, this excruciating pain and in my ankle and it never got better, never just seemed. And I, you know, right around Christmas time, I developed uh, some flu-like symptoms and just body aches and chills and just, you know, felt horrible. And, and so and my, my parents took me to the doctor. It was uh, initially just first blush, you know, small hometown doctor, Lamar, Texas, diagnosed it as acute arthritis in my ankle and, you know, prescribed some rest and some therapies and things like that. But it just progressively got worse. And right around the middle of January, um, supposed to go to school on a Monday, but I had just a horrible weekend. And the pain, it just got so unbearable that I – told my parents I wasn't going to be able to, you know, I couldn't go to school. So um, somewhere that Monday, middle of the day, uh, I tried to make a phone call to my mom's junior high and just to let her know that I was, I was not doing well. And um, the secretary of the school, who's a family friend, uh, you know, could under, you know, knew who was on the other line. And my mother rushed home, found me in the hallway uh passed out uh just uh my ankle was swollen about the size of a cantaloupe uh she rushed me to the emergency room uh in which early on uh, somewhere during that evening they did exploratory surgery uh ankle kind of exploded just as, as you you would think of something that you know a tomato just and i woke up to in the recovery room with uh, a hole in the inner side of my left ankle that looked like maybe a shark had just taken a, you know, a bite out of my ankle. And so, uh, as things go, they eventually diagnose, they, they diagnosed it early on as osteomyelitis, which was an infection in the bone. And, you know, through a number of surgeries and, and just weeks and months in the hospital of never getting better, kind of riding this roller coaster of surgery, kind of get better, and then a crash. Um, and they eventually took me into surgery. Uh, there was a time frame where I'd gotten so bad, fever was so high, and infection and, can and cancer was just destroying uh, my leg and kind of my, you know, my body. And I was just, um, doctor came in and told, uh, my parents, I was packed in ice, like a, like a, like a fish just because of the fear was so high. And 
um, the doctor told my parents that they were taking me into surgery. They were probably, they were, they were going to have to make a decision whether or not they uh, amputate my leg from the knee down just because of the, how bad the infection was and how, how it was just eating from the inside out. And so when they got into, in at that time, they found some cysts that were growing on the bone. They were able to extract those. They were, they were able to kind of pinpoint the, the main area, the main source of, uh, of uh, the cyst. And, and, and then they were able to diagnose really what was going on. And, and uh, once we got to that point, uh, through modern medications and just, um, I started making, you know, some, some progress. Uh, they didn't obviously didn't amputate the leg, uh, but I was still in the hospital for another month, uh, going through therapies and medications. And, and so, uh, to which eventually I, you know, uh, I was able to get out of the hospital and go home, um, and then start to start that road to recovery. Wow. Wow. So then you, you know, you obviously went through and, and, and played, uh, into the minors and then, and then finally on July 23rd, 1991, bottom of the seventh at the at three River stadium, Jeff Bannister comes to the plate, gets a single off Atlanta's, uh, Dan Petrie. As it turned out, that ended up being the extent of your MLB career, kind of a moonlight Graham kind of thing, but, but you did something that a vast majority of folks could only dream of. So, what was it like getting that call up to the big leagues for that hot uh, evening in July? Well, you know, I it, 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 listen, it, it's with age and time and space between now and that moment, uh, a much greater appreciation uh, for that, that day, that moment, that night, right? It's, um, you know, kind of the story goes, the, the, the night before I got that, I made that debut. Terry Collins, we were, I was in Buffalo playing, and uh, Jeff Richardson, uh, Whitey, the, the, the kind of journeyman shortstop, was my roommate. We were in Buffalo, we just finished a game the next morning. We were gonna, you know, have first morning flight out to go to Oklahoma City to, to start our series against Oklahoma City, and and my wife and my mother, and and you know, some family members from Oklahoma were going to, to meet us there. And so, uh, but Whitey and I used to joke with each other every time the phone would ring after a game and even at night, and, you know, when it would ring, it was, oh, it's, you know, who's on the line? Oh, it's Terry Collins. He just got called up to the big leagues, you know. And so the phone rang that night. And I was expecting my wife to, to call me to let me know that they had made it to Oklahoma City. And, and while I hear, hear Whitey on the other line, and then all of a sudden he's like yelling at me, he's like, hey, Banny, it's TC. You're going to big leagues, man. I'm like, yeah, shut up. Give me the phone. And uh, <laughs> so, we, you know, we had done that so much to each other. And so I get on the line, I hear this voice, and, and uh, Terry goes, hey, Banny, how long have you waited for this call? And I'm like, well, if you're my wife, about 30 minutes. And he goes, no, 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 really? How long have you waited for this call? And I'm like, what are you talking about? He said, well, Don Slot got hurt. They're calling you up to the big leagues tomorrow. I said, shut them. Who is this? You know, I was kind of in disbelief. I thought somebody was playing a joke on me. We had, you know, the only source, you didn't have social media back then. And so the only source was... ESPN and so we we were always watching the highlights of the game I didn't see Sluggo get hurt he wasn't even in the game so how the hell did he get hurt and it took Terry about 15 minutes to kind of convince me that you know that Sluggo really got hurt and I was the guy and they're calling me up and and I even even the next morning when I went to the to the airport because the flights, the flights that they gave me were very close to the same time that we were supposed to be leaving to go to Oklahoma City to, you know, that I was going to Pittsburgh. And so I got to the airport. I went to the counter and sure enough, I had a first class ticket waiting on me. Uh, got on that bird, flew to Pittsburgh. And uh, uh, <laughs> it was uh, it was very surreal walking into Three River Stadium. and and. 
they took me to the clubhouse. The clubhouse was dark. It was like 11 o'clock in the morning. And, and sure enough, there was a jersey. And it had my name on it already. And it was sitting in a locker between Bonds and Bonilla. And, oh, wow. you know, and so it was like, you know, and obviously, you know, those guys going through spring training with them and being around them. And, um, but just to see my name on the back of that jersey was, it, it was incredible. Um, you know, fast forward to the start of the game, nervous as hell. You know, can't feel my legs and I don't know how to act. And, you know, I'm sitting on the bench and you got Leland walking, pacing up and down with a cigarette in between his hands, blowing smoke and barking at the umpires. And, you know, John Wayner just got called up. And if you if you go back and check, I think that Rock had, had – he was on this incredible tear as a rookie of, of hits early on in his career. And all of a sudden on the scoreboard, it had Wayner, uh, Trainer, Paul Wayner, you know, all these names and John Wayner, and it was a hit tracker. It was a total number of hits of all these guys, Hall of Famers, and just and then John Wayner. Leland gets on the phone in the dugout and just starts tearing a hole into the the the, the uh, press box and whoever was running the. I'll have that Epson sent out tomorrow. You know, it's just old school. And I'm like, I grab, I grab my gear and I went straight to the bullpen. I'm like, and uh, you know, a couple innings later, you know, the bullpen phone rings, and and you know, I, hey, Bandy, you're you're pinch hitting for Dre back, and just the immediate rush. And I just sprint down to the dugout. I'm looking for my bat. I'm looking for my helmet. I can't find any of it. They'd take, you know, all those guys. You play the trick on the rookie, right? Mean, meaningless game. We're beating the fire out of Atlanta. Um, and I'm going to pitch hit for Drayback. Uh, and I'd always told myself, and just as a kid in the backyard or playing, you know, it's like, you ever get that opportunity? I'm look. I'm looking to hit the ball in the upper deck. I'm not even going to whatever. First, well, first pitch, Petrie just dials one up right underneath my chin, and I'm like, okay, you know, that woke me up a little bit. Now I'm, I'm, you know, breathing a little bit, and I can feel my legs, and you know, slider. I'm like, yeah, okay, whatever. And then next pitch. Uh, you know, I hit it well, barreled it on the ground. And I thought, shit, I got to use the two two things that had been taken away from me so many times in my life. And on the, a little help from the turf and three rivers, but I was able to beat it out. Um, I'm looking around and, and it hit me that I had nobody in the stands. Nobody. No family member, nothing. And it was a very for momentary it was very lonely yet it was very crowded because there were so many people in my life that I carried and they helped push me down the first baseline to you know what eventually was the only plate appearance that I had in the big leagues and there was a time frame after that when I got sent out that you know, it was, I was pretty bitter and I never got that opportunity to go back. And like I tell you, it's like time away. And I see, and I've been in this game long enough and coached it in the major league level, managed it and been the guy that said, Hey, I, this rookie's pinch hitting tonight. I'm going to get him in the game and allow him to have this opportunity because they're so fleeting. You know, we appreciate the, the stars and the guys that are around for a long time, but there are so many and they come up and they go down and they never return. And I just, I've been blessed to be able to, 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 you know, learn an appreciation for, for what Jim Leland and the Pittsburgh Pirates gave me. All right.
All right, Jeff, uh, since I'm up here in Canada, I might have a few Canadian type questions for you here. Uh, uh oh, um, here we go. No, no, I'll save that one to last. <laughs> I'm going to save that one to the end so we can finish that one off there. But uh, I, you just talked about your first uh, game in the big leagues. Your first managing job was in Welland, Ontario in, in 1994, right, with the Pirates organization, of course. And you had three guys on that team that made the big leagues from Miguel Ojeda, John Kane Davis, and Kevin Pickford. Um, remember those three guys, and also tell us about your time in Ontario as managing your first your first team. First of all, thank you, and and, and it's uh, I I had a blast um, in Welland. Uh, it uh, you know little town sits in between Buffalo and Niagara Falls and all that you know Toronto and um, my wife was able to come up and spend uh, part of the summer with me there, but really enjoyed um, that atmosphere and kind of um, something that I'd never really, an area I've never really experienced before. And, and uh, so great time and, and just a tremendous group of, uh, of uh, players that you get out of the draft their first year. And some guys, we were supposed to have Jose Guillen on that, on that club too. Uh, but the, the, as we were leaving, um, the day before we were leaving to, to, to go north to come to Welland, he decided that he didn't need to show up for a, one of our team meetings. And I said, well, I guess we don't need – I decided we're not going to take you. So <laughs> just old school, you know, it's like, all right, you can't show up, then you don't get to go. But, uh, you know, Pickford, Davis, uh, Miguel Ojeda, listen, I, they're all – I remember those guys. I still, I still stay in contact with most of them. And, and you know, there are times. Um, I went to Kevin. My wife and I went to Kevin's uh, and, and his wife's wedding in Vegas. And and Kane, I still, you know, uh, we'll, we'll share fishing stories every once in a while. Miguel, I've I've kind of watched from afar as he's you know he managed uh, in in. Um, some winter balls and some, you know, it, it, so uh, had some success on his own. And, and there, I, I really, I tell young coaches all the time that I had to go back and apologize to, to those guys. It, it, you know, as you get older, you realize I didn't know shit. I didn't know anything about managing a game of baseball. I knew baseball, but I didn't, I mean, it's like you get thrusted into this role and people think you can do this and, and, you know, you have all these people that, that you've seen and you've experienced and played for. And so I was trying to, to be all these different impactful coaches that I had in my life and trying to be all of them at the same time. And, and then I, you know, I realized that I just, you know, it's more important to be authentic and be who you are and, and develop those relationships with your players. And uh, listen, there are so many guys that coming off of that, that Welland team, Tonka Maynard, you know, you know Steve Toby, Jonathan Sweet, Mike Ashey, uh, Derek Swafford. I mean, the guys that uh, – Matt Ammon. I mean, there, 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 there are so many guys I still stay in contact with, and they taught me a lot. That, they probably taught me more than, than I taught them. So before we move on to the, the Texas Rangers, which we're, I'm sure we're going to get to here in a, in a few minutes, you spent almost 30 years in the, in the Pirates organization one way or another. And, and this is a question that even kills me that I have to ask, but what needs to change for the Pirates to, again, become that franchise that, that Brian and I grew up with? We were there for Bonds. You know, we caught, like, the tail end of Stargell and, and that crew. But – uh uh, you know, what, what, what needs to change is, I mean, in Pittsburgh, they'll say it's the ownership, but I feel like it's gotta be something more deeper than just that. Well, first of all, you, you feel fortunate that you have, you develop that rich appreciation for your team, my team. That was my team, not my team. I was, they shaped me, they grew me up, they groomed me. And I got to experience everything in, in Major League Baseball, professional baseball through the Pittsburgh Pirates and, and um, such a, 
such gratitude and, and grateful for the fans in Pittsburgh and the community of Pittsburgh to shape me and, and, and who I am and, and who I need to be. Um, it's unlike any other place in sports. And deep love and appreciation for, for I mean, there's still, you know, black and gold still runs through my veins. Um, so, um, really, I asked, I asked Bob Nutting this um, la uh, last year when we were in town playing uh, Buckos. And he had me walk across, and I've got a great relationship with Bob and, and um, you know, pretty close to, to his family. And, and I asked him, I said, Bob, when's the last time there was a player that retired as a pirate? Hmm. And, and, he, and, he, and he kind of he had no answer. Well, part of the, the answer lies in that. This is a business, and, and I understand the business of baseball and, and the ability to, to have a budget and, a, and you know, how you construct your roster and financially and things like that. However, the tradition that is unlike any other in, in, in baseball, be it Pittsburgh Pirates, and you start naming the names, you look up, you see the Hall of Famers, and you see the – the the you know one of one of the teams that was the the founding mem members of Major League Baseball, and they haven't won a World Series since '79, and we had 21 years of losing. It's the ability to keep your marquee players. It's the ability to keep your star players. It's the ability to can continue to grow that culture that is inside the city of, of Pittsburgh and, and understand what, you know, the fan base needs from their players. They don't need, you'd like to have great players. I love that McCutcheon is back in, in, in the pirate uniform. That means something. That means something. An MVP player to come back and, and A, want to come back and B, and put the uniform on tells you a lot. I hope he retires as a pirate. Because that will mean something. To keep, if you look across baseball and you just look at the names of the players that are star players, they're winning and decorated that were that started as a pirate. And you go, man, there's an all-star team out there every we year. We used to do that every year, yep. And so you gotta keep them. You don't have to keep all of them. Sometimes the financial constraints get to the point to where they're – and I understand the turnover of baseball, but when you look at teams and, and great teams, they still have great players. You need great, talented players to win championships. You need culture guys in your clubhouse like Josh Harrison that, that have the ability to energize the room. You need those type of guys that, that, that are there on an everyday basis – and whoever they are, but you got to be able to keep them. Um, because it is – the division is, is not easy. It's never going to be easy. And so uh, I believe in the city. I believe that, that there's um, – you find those core group of players, you sign them up, keep them uh, – Listen, I, I, you know, Ben Charrington, I, you know, is, uh, I've had an opportunity to spend a little bit of time around him. I, 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 I believe that this is, this guy is going to get it done. Um, I know that it's a monumental task. You had to tear down a team to start rebuilding it. It's just, it's unfortunate that Pittsburgh has to continue to do that. I mean, um, marquee franchise don't it shouldn't have to be done that way no doubt. well in, in 2014 uh texas rangers they won only 65 games fifth place in the al west ron washington fired you became the new manager in 2015 
Uh, the team wins 23 more games in the previous year, uh, wins the AL West. You were presented with the Manager of the Year Award. So how were you able to get things turned around in Arlington so quickly? Yeah, that's um, great players. Um, listen, there's – I think managers come in with uh, knowledge, experience, belief system. However, you got to develop those relationships to get those players to, to buy in. I was fortunate enough to have Adrian Beltre and Prince Fielder and, and – you know, we eventually had Cole Hamels, um, Elvis Andrews, Robinson Chirinos. You know, some of them were Hall of Fame names. Some of them are not household names. They're only household names in the, in the area of Arlington and, and Dallas, Fort Worth, that North Texas area. Uh, if you go back and look, we won, I think, eight games in the first month. Uh, it, it was a struggle. However, I had a great coaching staff that they believed in the message that I was, I was trying to send forward. Um, and they bought in. You know, Steve Bouchelle and Tony Beasley and Mike Maddox and um, Dave Magadan, a group of, group of coaches that, that I owe a lot to because they were, they were much better than me. Um, they found a way to, to take – the messages that that I was given to them, and and it was it was tough at times because it was my expectations were sometimes the highest in the room, and, and that that becomes a challenge. And and when you're not winning games, it's hard to to continue to to breathe that message. But I had a great mentor and and Leland. I had a great mentor and and Clint Hurdle, who who is a master at delivering messages, right? And, and, and Leland was a master at touching people and making them believe that they could do greater things. My own father, who was a coach, and, and, and taught me the same thing. And so I just never quit on that message. I was willing to, to, um, to not give in. Um, when we finally got to, I, I'll, never, I'll never forget it. Uh, John Daniels, the, the GM, when it was trade deadline, and we were, we were like nine games back, seven games under 500, and we were talking these trades. And he called me around midnight, the 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 night before the deadline, and we had talked about getting Cole Hamels, but we talked about it in you know I'm talking about it this year, like right now, and what the impact would be. You know, he talked about like next year and the next year and the contract and you know how the impact i said no jd you don't understand we're going to win this division this year and he goes what he says i'm not even sure that we're going to win you know 81 games let alone win the division i said no we're this group of guys is starting to turn the corner you could see it and feel it you could hear it in a clubhouse they were starting to to anytime we'd have a comeback win you know, that whole never quit attitude, we were never out of it. And they were, you know, they started playing with electricity and Odor shows up and it's like this energizer and he's just killing the baseball and attitude and and he, you know, brought this electricity. So we pulled the trigger on Hamels. Now all of a sudden we've got somebody in the front of that rotation that has got the pedigree and what people don't realize, they've never been around him, this unwavering ability to compete this you know looks like Clark Kent you know he's a nice guy and you no know, he wants to eat your heart out you know and which helped Adrian kind of continue to be that guy too because Adrian's the same way I mean supreme competitors and this like they just want to they want to beat you and smile at you every night just like have this great smile with I'm ripping your heart out of your chest every single night. And so, I, again, I'm, I was fortunate, blessed to have great players, guys that bought in, and great coaches that could go out and, and, and deliver that message on a nightly basis. All right, Jeff, the, um, I want to talk about the Alou family for a second. The, yes. Uh, Felipe Alou is, of course, in our Hall of Fame for all the years with the Expos organization and 
in all the things he did there. But his son, Moises, you played with Moises basically every year in the minor leagues. And uh, I want to talk about the Alou family. And, and like, did you know, could you tell Moises was going to be a 15-year big leaguer when you're playing with him down in single A? And uh, just anything you can tell us about the Alou family. Yeah, well, listen, I played for Felipe, too. I played for Felipe for uh, Escojito in, in uh, the uh, Dominican Winter League. So a very, you know, again, fortunate to be around great people. Uh, first time that that I, I met Moises, he, we, had already, we were already playing in Macon, Georgia. He signs and, you know, we heard about, you know, that we were going to get him and he shows up late the first day. And uh, uh, so Dennis Rogers was the manager at the time. And, and so Dennis wasn't real happy with all that. And so, but still you get, you know, we're putting him in a lineup. He's going to play. And, um, you know, you see this kind of just stretched out athletic body and these just massive hands. And he got in the box with such his first at bat, like, I don't care who's on the mound, throw the ball. And you first swing, I'm like, puts the ball in play. And you just, I mean, you see these legs and just bodies flying all over the place. And I'm like, man, but yet uh, athletic. And, and you asked the question of, of, did I know that he was going to be a 15-year big leader? I didn't know he was going to be a 15-year big leader, but I knew he was going to be a big leader. The, the arm, the ability to play the outfield, the attitude, you know, unafraid in the box. Um, you know, when we, when Montreal was able to get him and we kind of, and we lost him, I thought, wow, man, that's, you know, uh, you know, as a young guy, you kind of question, it's your, you know, some of those decisions. But uh, listen, I love being teammates with Moises on a nightly basis. And, and, and just, I wished I had some of his ability. You know, it was, you know, Felipe too. It, it, look, there's um, Felipe was like like listening to Moses, that deep baritone, slow talking voice, and it, it, you just want to lean in every time he talked, and you just wanted you. He was going to say some something and have a nugget of you know brilliance that you, as a player, you could just believe in, and and. Um, and I loved playing for, for him. And I was I'm like, man, that would be a great guy to, you know, post up for every single night. And, and even to, to this day, you know, there's, I think about those times. And, uh, but, you know, I, but I still, one, one, one kind of image I have of Moises is, you know, him in, in Chicago, in the Bartman ball. And, and, and I'm like, well, you never got over and caught that ball anyway, so don't even. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Yeah, Brian. Okay. Um, Jeff, you're currently the bench coach with the uh, Arizona Diamondbacks. Uh, what has it been like working with uh, Tori Lovello and, and the D-backs? They are, seem to be a team that's trending upward. So what can we expect to see in the 2023 season? Yeah, very similar to what, um, you know, the kind of the early 13, 2012, 2013, um, you know, those Pittsburgh teams to where we had some young, exciting players that, you know, as they gain experience that, that there's, they're figuring it out. I mean, between Zach Gallon, and Merrill Kelly at the, you know, in that rotation. And, and it's still Bumgarner, who, who's a great competitor and kind of, you know, being the, the old salt now that, that uh, helping teach a lot of these young pitchers that are coming up and Ryan Nelson and, and, and guys like that. You're just great arms. It, it just make me remember of what kind of we, we had in Pittsburgh before getting our first wild card game and um, the outfield of it's, we call it the no fly zone. I mean, they're athletic. They can fly uh, Corbin Carroll and Thomas and got the kid from uh, Guriel from Toronto, the catcher from Toronto. Who I saw it today for the, for the first time, this hugely athletic uh, 
I think we're going to have uh, a pretty special team on any given night. I think we're still going to have some challenges, you know, division that we're in. But I like how we kind of finished our season last year, the ability to make some noise out there. Uh, and these guys have that, that edge and that belief. It's just unlocking it on a nightly basis. And Tori is – I love being around Tori. Tori is a very – so we, he and I are so, so different. I mean, it's – you know, he's, he's a little more buttoned up than I am, a little more polished in, in, in how he does things. I'm, I'm, you know, a football coach's son, an ex-football player that's out there. You know, I'm pounding away, and I'm like – Yelling at everybody and going, you know, not, but just a little more, a little different energy. And we complement each other in how we manage people. We still care about people. He allows me to to have a, a very broad lane of communication inside that clubhouse, which is great for me. I think he he relies on the experience, uh, and you know we we share great knowledge with each other inside that inside that dugout that. Uh, we feel comfortable that we're going to be able to figure some things out with, and we, and we, in the experience, you know, listen, we got Brent Strong sitting there, you know, one of the best pitching coaches in all of baseball kind of directing that whole, that pitching staff. So there's a, there's a huge comfort zone in that. And um, I love the prospects of where we can dream ourselves to be here before too long. It's not going to be a dream. We're going to be knocking on some doors and there's going to be some teams that are going, Oh shit. We got to play the Diamondbacks, as opposed to hey, we get to play the D backs, right? That's there's a different story there. Excellent. All right, Jeff. Here's my last question, so you might be able to guess what it's about. And uh, I was I was lucky enough to be in the press box that game, uh, so I was in the stadium. Um, you know, from Russell Martin and Chu's play at the at the plate, Andrews's three errors, Cole Hamill pitching well on the mound, and dealing with those errors, Batista's home run, like, I don't know what type of question I could ask you, you know, other than, like, what happened? Like, how did that all happen? Like, what were you guys thinking? Did you know that true play was, like, the right call right away when everyone else in the whole stadium was confused? Like, Elvis Andrews, like, he doesn't make errors. He's a great player. And three in that one inning, uh, you know, Hamill's an all-star pitcher, and he just had to watch all that unfold. And, and then, of course... <laughs> The big home run at the end. So, as yeah. someone from Pittsburgh, Jose Lean doesn't make errors either, but it just happened. <laughs> so. Oh, you had to bring up Lean, huh? Yeah, yeah. Sorry. Yeah, we Chico, love you, Lean. Though we love you. <laughs> Chico never made an error. Um, yeah, are your ears still ringing from the noise in that stadium? I, I, I think I got tinnitus right now just from. Uh, the time in Pittsburgh in 13 and, and the, the home run that, that Martin hit uh, to Toronto. Listen, yeah, did I know? Yes, I knew that um, I try to stay as attentive to everything in the game as I possibly can. There are little things that I pay attention to. When I saw Russell uh, throw the – the ball off a of chew, the knob of chew's bad, and and I knew that there wasn't timeout. There was no dead ball there, and you know, just a heads up old door sprints across the plate. And when it was kind of a situation where, when I went out to talk to the umpire and I asked him, I said, "You do you have time out there?" And he immediately, you could just see the flush in his face, and he goes, "No, I didn't, did I?" So nobody did. That's a live ball. I said, I, I suggest you get on the, the headphones to New York and get this one right. I'm just saying, I'll live with whatever, whatever New York tells us, but we need to get this one right. And when they came back and just what happened after that was one of the most – incredible spectacles in all the sport I've ever been involved in. Just from that point forward, that game and the intensity level and, and just everything up to that point where we jumped out to a 2-0 lead in the series and, and just Toronto coming back and the series and, and just 
and really kind of the, 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 we were two teams that respected each other, but we competed so hard against each other. Like they loved to play against us. We loved to play against them. We loved to hate them at any moment. We loved to hate them. And, you know, the competitive hate, not, not, oh, I hate you. It's just that competitive hate. And, and, you know, in that environment and just, you know, from beer cans raining down from the, the, the stadium and, you know, just everything that went on. I was about 30 seconds away from pulling our club off the field at one point and, and just going, we can't do this. Um, I was so proud of our guys to maintain their focus and really the ability to play. What happened to Elvis Andrus will never happen to Elvis again. Um, my heart hurt for him. I couldn't stop it. As a manager, I'm like, I'm watching this and I'm going, okay, I've got some decisions to make here. I knew I wasn't going to take him out of the game. I knew that I trusted him. If anybody on the field other than Adrian Beltre you trusted to have the ball hit to was Elvis. And to watch that unfold in that end was just, I, it was a nightmare you couldn't undo because you're living it, you're watching it. And kind of in the manner of how, how it all happened, I cringed for Elvis. But I was so proud of our players that rallied around him. And even, even Cole Hamels and the ability to – and I kind of look back at that, that moment that – when I walked out and I had a conversation with Maddox and, 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 you know, do we make a pitching change here? I, if there was anybody that I trusted in our pitching staff to, to, to handle the moment, it was Cole. But it's one of those managerial decisions that I have to live with on a, you know, a daily basis. And I'm not so stubborn as to say, oh, I made the right decision. I look back at it and I thought, now and I go, you know, maybe I made the wrong decision, but I was like, something had to change in that moment. And I made a change. I went and got uh, Dyson, guy that had been so hot for us. And, and really just, if you go back and, and, and look at what he had done the last month of the season, he was one of the, the, the biggest beast out of the bullpen and of any club and what he would, I mean, he was breaking two, three bats every night, and nobody was hit. And so made a decision, brought him in. And when Bautista hit the ball, I knew immediately that it was gone. Um, I was, you know, the whole bat flip deal and all that, it really – I wasn't angry at the bat flip. I was disappointed at the, the home run, kind of the outcome. The heartbreak, my heart for for our players, for our coaching staff, for our families, for our fans. Um, but it was one of the loudest environments I've ever been in. And, I mean, incredible for, for Toronto, uh, but to face our, our, our players after that game. And, to, you know, I walked in after I immediately went to – to Elvis, I hug him, and I said, this is not the defining moment in your career. It's a moment that you'll, you'll remember and we'll all remember. However, it's not, not, and I never believe in the whole one single player wins or loses a game. I mean, we like to think that in baseball. Oh, it's, you know, a closer gives up a homer late. Well, starter probably walked two guys that he shouldn't have earlier in the game that turned that lineup over so that that closer had to face those certain guys. Right. And, and it's just, I don't, I don't believe in that. You, we don't play that baseball con contagion that, 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 Hey, no, every single domino affects everything that, that, that happens. So it's not just one moment and um, try to virtually wrap my arms around a group of guys that were hurt. Um, you know, obviously the next year, 
there was a meeting between us and Toronto. And, um, you know, I'm, I manage the team. Uh, I, I allow our, our guys to kind of to be in the competitive moment. And you got to understand my history with, with Jose. I had known Jose since he was 16 years old. Coached him, been around him, mentored him, learned with him, learned from him, tried to help coach some things out of him, even part of a time where, you know, help Jose grow, grow up. And we had to suspend him at one, uh, at one point um, when he was in the minor leagues, but also admired what he had done in his major league career. Um, you know, the whole, you know, him being hit by a pitch, the slide at second base, Odor, him squaring off, um, probably a moment in time where a young player hits another star player. People don't realize that that, that moment, um, there was some adverse effects for Rugnet Odor as well. Um, ugly for baseball. Uh, but it's part of the game um, and had an opportunity this winter at the winter meetings to finally see Jose, you know, face, face to face, turned around. We were at the, and I saw him, he's walking up and typical Batista fashion. We, we hugged, said, I love you, bro. He said, I love you, bro. And, you know, it's, we both understand that there were things in, in, in this game that it's part of it. It happens. Um, it's part of the competitive nature. Fans don't always understand it, uh, but uh, still love him, appreciate him for what he did in his career. A great player for Toronto. Um, but as, as lives and, and situations collide in our game, uh, we'll probably always be connected for that. I'll still see the bat flip. I'll still see the pitch being thrown. Um, but also believe that those are the things that shape us and shape our mentalities and shape our, our lives. And, and me as a manager will sh shape me for the next opportunity that, uh, you know, in that decision-making process for a group of players and coaches. All right. Batista, Thanks for talking uh, about that, Jeff. <laughs> <laughs> Batista is another guy the Pirates gave up on, man. That's, that's just moved him on. But uh, so before before I ask the last question here tonight, man, I, I just I just gotta say, like Jeff, I can feel like the the love, the emotion, the respect you, that you have for the game, and oh man, it's like it's like it's like actually like been tearing me up here a little bit. So it's just it's just wonderful. It's, it, it's, it's an honor to have you on. I really appreciate this. But um, okay, so. I know that uh, I think it was two years ago you uh, interviewed for the Astros job um, <laughs> with, with Dusty Baker. I mean, you're 59 years old now. How long do you plan on going in the game? Uh, you know, and what do you think the future holds for you? Obviously, Arizona this season is in front of you, but uh, are you still looking to try and get back to the head managing position? Yeah, you know what, I, in, in kind of – multi-layers to that question right it's like as long as my family is is okay with me doing this i'll 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 do it till they rip it off the, the uniform off of it. um i'm blessed to have gone through all the things i've gone through um through the adversity how it shapes us um, this game brought me back to life. Um, kept me alive in, in some really dark times as a kid and as an adult. Um, I love the people in the game. Do I want to manage again? Yes. I love that aspect of it. It's... it's um, but I'm not so egotistical and to think that it's the only spot that you make an impact. Sometimes it's the, 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 the least 
uh, impactful spot other than your decision making because you're so pulled away from so many people and the players and the mentoring and the coaching, the teaching, and just the relationships. Um, I feel like there's still some unfinished business in, in, in that, you know, part of my life. Um, I still have great energy for this game. My body's healthy. Um, but right now, 100% focus on Arizona Diamondbacks being the best bench coach I can be for Tori Lovello, um, help him be the best manager he possibly can. And along the way, impact some players that, that are going to win a, you know, a championship for the uh, Scottsdale Phoenix community, Arizona. Uh, I believe in that. Um, and if somebody thinks that, I still have what it takes to, at some point, run their club. And um, look, I'm willing to listen to them. And but right now, uh, you know, it's. I was asked that question at the end of the year last year, and you know, same answers as it always has been. I mean, look, I got I got a new watch. Can you can see what that says as an Arizona Diamondback. Yeah. I'm all in, just like I was all in in that blue uniform and all in like I was in that, that, that black and gold. I don't know any different. Awesome. Awesome. Th thank you so much, Jeff. I, I was just a, a extraordinary interview. I, I really I felt like everything you were saying. That, that was awesome. Thank you for being on here today. today. Well, thank you guys for having me. And it's been a blast. Uh, glad we 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 found I could find the time for you. Um, you know, good luck in all of it. And uh, again, love what you guys do. Thank you so much. I'll remind everybody, hit that like and subscribe button. And we'll see you all next time. Thank you for watching.